Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Say that I'm going to take that as a yes. So, yeah. uh, a couple <laughs> things. Roberta, it's so good to see you. Hi, Hi. so good to see you. You're from Boulder. That's so good. great. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, a couple of things I want to, uh, I'm just turning off my phone here so it doesn't interrupt us. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, I want to, uh, it seems like everyone has done this in any event, but I want to make sure folks are muting themselves. If you need to interject or you want to say something, it's a small enough group that that's fine. But if you're not talking and you just kind of have it on in the background, it would be great to mute in that way. Barking dogs or strangers wandering through your house won't, uh, or whatever it might be, <clears throat> won't cause uh, too much interference in the background. So, Rabbi, uh, this is the uh, can I ask a question? second session of the, uh, oh, sorry, one other thing I wanted to say, and that is that um, Jemmy is, uh, is, I believe, on the call, and she's been kind enough to moderate, so there she is, look at that, presto. So if there is, uh, if there are questions that people want to put into the chat, um, then you can, but what, what we're going to do is... Um, I'm going to I'm going to present and then we'll kind of as we did last time I'll, I'll present some text we'll walk us through it and then I will you know we'll pause for questions and comments and input and um, you know because one of the things that I'm interested in is you know we are experiencing whatever whatever it is that we're experiencing in terms of community and whether one can have community in this context which is really what the topic is of this class we're experiencing it in real time and you have insights into what it feels like and whether this is something you would call community and so uh, your own insights not only the text but also re reflecting on your own experience as we go through this is, is going to be very important so i wanted to um I wanted just to uh, to make time in the conversation for us to reflect about that. The last thing I'll say is that I shared via chat, I shared the sources for tonight's class. Um, so if you are clever enough to figure out how to how to access that somewhere in virtual space is this um, is the source sheet. <clears throat> But actually, uh, what I wanted, oh, no, Natan, oh, okay, hold on, let me, re, let me, maybe I have to redo it. Yeah, hold on. Hi. Because right, I can't, I, it's a long story, that is correct. One sec. I am.
Yes. Okay, so I just sent it uh, into Chatville. Those are the sources for tonight's class. And hey, while I'm at it, I have a question. Go off. I'll share the text from the first class. All right, you see those? So hold on, Natan, will you unmute? Because I took from your shake of the head that you know how to access texts that have been shared. Am I wrong? Um, no, I haven't done it before. All I see in my chat is that there's a- there's oh, a oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Hold on, I still have my music going here. One second. <laughs> sorry, so sorry. Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. You just Do you did. want me to turn my face? There were people on my Facebook Live that were listening to the national news with me. Do you want me to turn it off or can they listen to this too? Um, I, th I guess that's okay. Uh, yeah, actually, no, you know, I'd like for people who want to be in on, thank you for, thank you for asking. And I All think right. for people I'll who want, people who want to be in on the class would, you know, would follow that link. So. All right, I'm turning this off, you guys. I'll be back later. All right, thank you. You. Natan, can you tell people how to access the files that I just uh, uploaded via chat? No, I don't see them. Oh, interesting. Yeah, right. we we don't see anything in the chat except Natan saying. Oh, maybe I. Oh, not I mean, <laughs> all right, hold on. I just I very. Uh, yep, here we go. Let's try this again. This one. This should work this time. I'm sure of it. Oh, you sent it to me. <laughs> yeah, Oops. I know. Oh, there you go. There you uh -huh. go. Yeah. I just, out of respect for the president of the congregation, I wanted to make sure Daniel had it first. Right. When was the first class? Last week. Oh, I guess I missed uh, it. Okay. So the, the, first th the first attachment was uh, the sources for tonight's class, which is class two. And uh, the other one, then I, after that, sent the sources for class one that we talked about last time. Okay. Josh, we are not Rabbi, mm -hmm. it's Donna. Um, I, I asked this in the chat. I thought Jimmy might answer, but would it be preferable for me to unvideo while I eat dinner or simply <laughs> mute myself? <laughs> That's such a great, like, new question. I don't, I mean, I'm going to leave that up to you. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. Okay. Great question. Off we go then. I mean, maybe, one, I don't know. I mean, it's so fascinating. One way to answer the question is, one way to answer it is, if I were going into a class that was in actual three-dimensional space, would I bring my food with me? And then you could say whatever the answer is to that should guide me here. Or you could say, no, this is a new kind of way of being, and so we'll figure it out. But I trust your, your judgment because you're an excellent person. Oh, I welcome Alabaster McMelson, who's, uh, who's here. Thank you so much. Okay, here we go. We're going to jump. We're going to jump in. And <laughs> I'm going to start. Um, can we call you Al? <laughs> you can call me Betty or oh, Betty, you can call me Al. So can folks see this on the screen? Am I properly sharing yes. what's on? You see text on the screen? I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so listen. So these, these, this is just a, um, uh, this is a, these, these are texts that we looked at from last time. I just wanted to do, um, uh, actually, just a very quick review. So if you were not on the last call, and I'm moving too fast for you on this review period, it's okay, because I don't want to belabor this for the people who were on the last call. So I'm just going to summarize. We're going too fast to consider these texts carefully. This is just a recap. So um, we talked about last time, one of, one of the ways, one of the ways of asking what is community or how do we think about community is by looking at that question through a halachic lens, through a Jewish legal lens and looking at the halacha. We, I kind of did a, a snapshot of part of the halacha. So this class is not uh, an exhaustive overview of how Jewish law thinks about the constitution of community or what is a minion. Um, that's a that's a full conversation in and of itself, a full shiur in and of itself. But we did look at some of the key texts in which the rabbis ask, how do we constitute a minion? Um, because many people, as we'll talk about in a moment, many modern people in trying to figure out whether a minion, a, a prayer quorum, can be constituted virtually they look at the, the original sources in the Gemara and see if there's, of course, the Gemara never imagined virtual community in the way we 
talk about it, but they they wanted to know, is there some, by way of analogy, is there something that we can learn from the primary sources in the Gemara that will shed light on this? And so if you remember, we talked about the fact that in the, in the Torah, we learned that the Passover, um, the Passover offering has to be, um, has to be eaten in one house. If you see that, right, it shall be eaten in one house, which is an mm -hmm. odd phrasing. And so the Mishnah gets quite specific about this and says like, you know, each house has to have a Pesach, each enclosed area has to have a Passover offering. And you can't eat it in like, you can't start off the evening in one house and then run over to grandma's house with a like a, you know, part of that same Passover offering, part of the meat, and then go to grandma's house and ha you, that's not kosher right? You ha each offering has to be within an enclosed domain. And then the Mishnah goes on to get quite specific about what if you are, are within a single dwelling, but it has multiple rooms. Can you go, can you bring the Passover offering from one room to the next room? Um, in, in other words, two different groups across, uh, you know, um, on the other side of a wall could benefit from the same Passover offering. And the answer is no. That may seem ridiculously obscure to us. Like, what is this weird theoretical? And I mentioned last time, I didn't know if that was a theoretical or not. And I looked into it and um, it turns out that it was not a theoretical. The question of whether individuals within a single house, but in multiple rooms, um, whether they could partake of the same Passover offering or whether they need to needed a separate one, this is not a theoretical because, um, in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, um, during the uh, the festivals, the Chagim, what we call the Chagim, um, or we call the Shlosh Regalim, the three uh, Chagim, the three festivals, were pilgrimage festivals. Now, many of us, when we hear the word pilgrimage, we think of medieval Christians kind of schlepping around Europe and going to these beautiful, you know, places of uh, of pilgrimage for Christians, but we invented it. It's our, we, we should get credit for it because three times a year we were, we were a, a Jewish people and actually the halacha is Jewish males, but we're not talking about that today. We're required to go to Jerusalem and they were required to appear in Jerusalem and they were required to make an offering. And so there is um, huge numbers, like hundreds of thousands of people would have shown up in Yerushalayim. It's quite an incredible thing. And in fact, archaeologists have recently uncovered um, roads that previously, this is just like a, not relevant to our discussion, but it's an interesting footnote. Previously, people thought that the roads from the outlying areas to Jerusalem were made by the Romans. And the, uh, but in fact, it turns out that Jews in the territories, it seems, uh, this is what we at least some research has indicated that J Jews were the ones who made these pilgrimage roads to Jerusalem. And anyway, hundreds of thousands of people would have descended on Jerusalem um, by the time of the late Second Temple period. And uh, so they're all there and they need a place to go. And so I think that these dwelling places where people would stay, um, these questions about, hey, can I grab, can I just take that person's Passover offering and bring it into my room at the lodging? The answer is no. So from that discussion, um, it, when, when that discussion gets filtered through the rabbis in the Gemara, they say just, uh, there, there's a lot for us to learn about prayer, say the rabbis, in this discussion about, um, about how the Passover offering was to be eaten. And what they took from the discussion was just like people in one physical, excuse me, just like people in order to fill, fulfill the obligation of the Pesach had to be in one space doing the same thing, says the, says the Gemara. Um, so too, and here was the passage we focused on, so too uh, is that the case with prayer. So if you remember, we said Rav Yehuda said in the name of Rav. So Rav Yehuda said that Rav said, the halakha is similar, that is the halakha of prayer is similar to the halakha about Passover. Um, and that is the halakha. Okay, so the deal is that you need, people need to be in the same physical space, 
So again, just to step back, because we, I don't want us to get lost in the weeds, the conversation right now, this part of the conversation, what I'm talking about is what, what does Jewish law say about the constitution of a community? And one of the ways of thinking about co the community is do people have to be in the same physical space to constitute a prayer quorum? And the answer, according to the halacha, is yes. But very significantly, we didn't talk about this in, um, uh, too much in the context of the halacha, but there is a dissenting opinion. Now, the dissenting opinion does not hold sway. Because if you see here, the Gemara says, Rav Yehuda said that Rav said, the halacha, the law, is similar with regard to prayer. So that's the law, period. But Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi raises his hand and says, even a barrier of iron does not separate between Jewish people and their father in heaven. So in other words, he disagrees. He says a, a, a dividing room or the boundary of a house, that should not determine what constitutes a minion, but his voice just gets, gets to be an opinion that's voiced and it's not the halacha. But this is an extremely important concept um, that even a barrier of iron does not separate between the Jewish people and their father in heaven. And in other words, what he's saying is it doesn't matter if there's a wall. That makes no difference to God. Of course, God can hear our prayers. It's, 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 uh, you, you can almost hear like the, the, the pained vitriol that comes through that comment. How could we imagine that a physical barrier would prevent prayer, um, prevent a prayer quorum? And... I'm belaboring this because um, I think it's a very, behind that disagreement, there's a fascinating meditation on the nature of prayer. Should we, and, and, and also on the nature of Jewish community, should we think of community and prayer, um, for want of a better term, should we think of it horizontally, like its relevance is horizontal, that is, it connects us to other people, right? And, and when, when we are praying we are thinking about our connection to other people and that that has to be in place? Or is perhaps Yoshua Ben Levi suggesting that that's actually secondary? What really matters is whether God can hear us, so to speak. And therefore, um, why would we care about a house or walls or the, none of that should matter? So um, that, was, that was another part of the, uh, of the conversation. So now I'm going to do this. Now I'm going to look at, um, now you Rabbi, can I say something? I'm sorry, go ahead. Can I interject for a second? Yeah, but re really briefly, I'm going to make time for questions, as I said at the beginning. But okay, fine. Okay, fine. You want to hold on to never it? Never mind, never mind. No, no, okay. no. So, um, okay, so, uh, now I, this was, at, this text was actually part of our discussion last time. We didn't really spend a lot of time on it. And um, I, I do want to look at it just briefly. So, the to sources we've looked at so far are the Torah. We begin with the Torah in the discussion of the Exodus and the requirement that Pesach be eaten within the home. And then we talked about the Gemar The Talmud then looked at that text in all the ways we've just been talking about. The Shulchan Aruch, now when this text that we have in box number one of the, of the sources for class number two, um, the Shulchan Aruch is a law code. So now we've, we've leapt forward you know, a thousand or 1600 years in, in history here, because um, in the medieval period, um, the, shulchan, uh, the, the, the need for law codes, that is a sort of summary of like, what is the law? Um, it kind of in a way that's very clear and concise and organized in a way we can look up and research, that became kind of a pressing need for Jewish communities. And um, so the Shulchan Aruch addresses that. Hold on one second, because I just realized Oh, okay. So I'm hoping that we're recording. I just tried to record and Jemmy had asked me for, I was supposed to ask you for permission to ask the host for permission to record. So I think you need to second the motion. In any event, um, so in this law code, the law code is now summarizing a lot of the halakhic material, only some of which we talked about. And so um, it says, actually, will, will somebody, um, Roberta, since it's been so long since I've heard your voice, can you read this in English? Are you able to see that text right here? You got to unmute yourself, though. I'm there unmuted, but I can't see it. Oh, okay. This guy here, can you see that or no? What guy where? The text. 
Okay, if you can't I'm see not it all. Seeing any text. Okay, Anne, can you read this text? Uh, you're muted, you're muted, you're muted. Um, the one that starts all of the 10? Yeah. All of the 10 need to be in one place and the prayer leader with them. And the one who stands in the middle of the doorway between a part of a building and outside such that when one closes the door, one is in a place from the inside lip of the thickness of the door and outwards, it is like outside. One who stands behind the synagogue and in between them is a window, even if it is several stories high and even if it is not four wide. I think it's probably four amod. It's just talking about a particular unit of, of width. Uh -huh. And his face is seen by them. From there, he joins with them for the ten. Okay, so I don't, wow. want to, I don't want to go into the details here, but my, my point is just at a high level, the, the, what the law code makes clear is that, and again, this is not original to him, to the author of the Shulchan Aruch Yosef Karo, he's trying to summarize the debate of the Gemara, of the Talmud. And the, you don't need to get caught in the details here. The point is simply that already in the time of the, as the, as the halakha, as the law is being formed, they're already concerned with like, okay, how much do we have to lean in on this idea that people have to be in the same space? What if the person is sort of like not quite in the middle of the crowd or is standing near the door? Okay, that person is still part of the minion. But what if they're standing in the kind of uh, entrance way? Is that, does that constitute a minion? So you can see, um, and I'll, I'll, I want to explain now why we're looking at this and how this is relevant. You can see how this would be relevant to a discussion about virtual minyanim, because essentially the people are saying, what, what the rabbis are talking about is, if somebody is not in the same physical space, can, but they almost are, can they be counted in a minion? What if somebody is not in the house that, where the prayer is happening, for example, but they're standing outside right next to the window and they can hear, are they part of the minion? Right, so the rabbis consider all of these possibilities, and, I'm the, and the reason I'm belaboring this is not because that discussion um, in and of itself is interesting to me, but because in the halacha, um, as people in the modern day try to answer the question of whether we can constitute a prayer quorum, a minion, um, via Zoom or Skype, they are looking at these texts. Is there an analogy between our experience in virtual space and the experience that the rabbis are talking about? Because of course they couldn't have imagined what we're doing now. Like we take a second nature now that we're all zooming in, but um, is there an analogy? Uh, and in other words, were there comments about being on this side of the wall or that side of the wall incidental, or are they saying something that we need to think about that's important for us about what it means to be in community. And, and my question, uh, the question hovering over this whole class is, how important is physical proximity, being in the physical presence of another human being, how important is that in thinking about Jewish community? Um, okay, so one bit we did not get to, um, and if it seems like I'm racing through the text right now, I am, because the halakha, as I want to demonstrate to you, the Jewish law is one way for us to approach the question of whether we can constitute community virtually, okay? And so I don't want to spend all of our time talking about this, but I do want to introduce some of the broad outlines of the halakhic debate. So I'm going to, we're going to talk about this text, and then we'll pause and see if there are questions that either you want to voice or you want to chat. So um, in a separate, so... Okay, so the Shulchan Aruch here in the part we just read, it's it's part of part of his legal code called Orach Chaim. In in the same part, but in a later chapter, he says uh, he says this. And now, can I get uh, Phil Cohen? Would you read this for me? B box number two, if you can see that. Whoa! Okay. Sorry, my bad. No, I Go can't. Ahead. Okay. Uh, one should strive <clears throat> to pray in the synagogue with the community. If one is unable to come to the synagogue, one should coordinate one's prayer with that of the community. Similarly, those who live in small villages and do not have a minion should pray uh, Shacharit and Avrit at the time at the same time that the community prays. So I've always thought this is such a beautiful idea. 
It's because what we're talking about here is he, he is not, and you can't necessarily tell from what's written here, but this debate is not about whether you can be counted in a minion if you are remote from the synagogue. That's, that's not considered here. So if, if, you're, if you are in, um, so let's just imagine my dear beloved former congregant and friend Roberta Reinfeld is on the, is on the phone call here. So let's imagine that there's a minion in, in uh, Denver and Roberta is up in Boulder and they have nine in Denver and then there's poor old Roberta stuck in Boulder. And this is like back before there were synagogues in Boulder, let's imagine. And, um, uh, and the question is, if the question is, can she be, if she prays at the same time as they're praying in Denver, can they count her as the 10th person for the minion? The answer to that is no, they're not even considering that there. But they're saying, listen, when the community davens, that's when Roberta should daven. They, we're not going to count her as a minion, but when they say shachari, so she should find out before shachari, before the morning prayer, they should, she should find out when are you davening, when are you praying shachari, and she should make an effort to time her prayer to their prayer, which I think is a very beautiful idea, but more than beautiful, I think it's very important for us because it suggests something that we talked about last time, which is, and here's where we kind of go beyond the halakha, there is, of course, a form of community that goes beyond simply the boundaries of minion. There is some kind of like um, what, I, what I've called, what I am calling in my own emerging, work, emerging research on this, there is a sort of associational or, uh, or um, uh, identification with a community that's not limited to halakha. So you could say, of course, I can't be part of a prayer quorum, but those people are still my people. I still feel connected to them. And we know this because when you look at, uh, you know, we look around the world and we know, as I, I think the example I gave last time was when I light Shabbat candles, I'm aware that Jews within the same time zone are lighting Shabbat candles at the same time. I don't know who they are. I have nothing, you know, so much in common with them besides the fact that we are part of this religious community that you can't touch, see, hear, or feel, and that doesn't require proximity. So that's another way of thinking about the nature of community. So let me pause here. Um, I guess the best way to do this is um, if folks would, uh, would just raise their hands and then I'll call on you if you have a question about this. Uh, Roberta, excuse me, Phil Cohen. Well, when, I, when you talk about law. Wait, wait, Phil, can you lean in a little bit? It's a little hard to hear you. When you talk about laws, it seems to me that there's two types of laws. There's the laws of civility, like, you know, you can't hurt somebody. But there's laws of regiment, too, about, like, prayer. So, I mean, who's going to judge on prayer? For example, the two rabbis disagree, but who are they going to judge the third person, right or wrong? I mean, it, only God seems to be able to judge us, not, not, the, not anybody else. Interesting. So to me, there's no wrong answer, a right okay. answer. Interesting. I like that. And we're going to come back to the second part of your question a little bit later in terms of laws or right or wrong about right or wrong. We're going to come back to that. So thanks for mentioning that. Anybody else? Oh, hold on. I see many people. My little chat window is lighting up on fire. Let me see what we got. Um, so I'm going to read some chatted questions. Um, so uh, Eli said that or that Orachaim has a bit of connection to what Ravi Hosho and Levi said about the entire Jewish people's relationship with Hashem. So Eli, can you say more about that? You got to unmute yourself, brother. Well, Rabbi Shuv and Levi said that not even an iron barrier could separate the community from Hashem, right? Mm. right. So right. in that sense, if, if you are timing yourself to pray when you're alone with the time in which your community prays, to me that has a, a connection because it, it means that even if you're not in the same space, you're right. still Beautiful. you're still in a sense praying with the minion. Right. I see. Very nice. Yeah, that's right. There there is a nice connection to that between that and the and the the comment of Yoshua Ben Levi 
in which said there's an iron barrier can't separate. And, but what highlights, and then Anne, you're next. What, what that highlights for me, Eli, I love that comment, is that there, we do have these two dimensions we have to think about, which I think are so essential. One is the horizontal relationship. Can you be a connected Jew to other Jews? Um, can you form that kind of human community uh, virtually or in any other way? And the other question is, can you form a vertical relationship that is with, with Hashem, with God, um, even though you're in a disparate place? Or is it somehow a community essential to mediating your relationship with God, right? So is a Jewish life incomplete if it does not have the, the human community? Um, you're in, let me refine that. Is your relationship with God incomplete if it does not have a, the human community as an element of it? And Paul. Uh, you're muted, you're muted, you're muted. <laughs> I'm so sorry. There you go. Now you're muted again. You're muted, you're muted. Stop it. There you go. Okay. I was going to bring up the very same thing that, that, that this question of um, does our conversation with God need, need to have our, our proximity to our community with us? And I think that that's the answer, that the answer to the question has to be yes, because, because of the rules of a minion and because of this idea that when you're lighting the candles, everyone else is lighting the, because you're always thinking about time and like, um, and that everyone around the world is doing the same. You're looking at the same full moon, whether it's the same time or not, that it's this, that we have this huge sense of community that is based on time. Right. And, and we're all aware. And otherwise we could read any passage of the Torah on Shabbat and our community would be, re you know, and, but, but it's very clear that we need to do it as a group. Right, very nice. And, and so Anne is referring to, I think is referring to something that came up in the previous discussion last time, which is that we, um, we, we, I talked about Abraham Joshua Heschel's book, The Sabbath, and, and Heschel's beautiful paradigm that, that um, Jews build cathedral in time. That is our, the, the, it is the temporal realm that allows us to connect to the divine and not the spatial. So even in a, in a time when we are prevented from connecting, gathering in a physical place, right? And this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, Lahavdil, we're not nearly, of course, at, at such an existential crisis, but at the time of the destruction of the temple, this was a very, very material topic for the Jews. If we cannot gather in the place we're supposed to gather, can we still function as individuals and as a community in our relationship with God? And so in her reference to the, the time is connecting us, that's, uh, that's an important point. Okay, just a couple of brief other comments and then I'm gonna dive back in. I'm just reading from the chat here. One is, uh, I'll go in reverse order. Natan said, uh, quoting a very beautiful uh, principle or teaching in the tradition, alti frosh min hatsibur, which means like don't separate yourself from the community. Um, and uh, that, that, that principle is, is kind of foundational to Jewish life. And Natan says, in my view, there is no way of truly connecting to the divine with all, without also having connection to other people. And um, uh, I, I think that is, I actually think that's absolutely true. And we talked about at the very, very tail end of last time's discussion, uh, of, of the discussion last time, I had said that this is actually an essential theological principle that God is holding out God's hand, so to speak, um, in the Torah and in rabbinic literature, not to the individual Jew to reach out, um, but, to the, but to Knesset Yisrael, to the, to the people of Israel. Of course, God hears the prayer of an individual. Our, our Torah texts attest to that, the foundational text about prayer, the prayer of Hana. Um, attest to that, and many, 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 many passages in the Gemara attest to that. So for sure, God heeds the prayer of the individual and cares about the individual, but ultimately, to fully realize the healing of the world that is required, or the Torah demands, um, it has to involve the, the, the community, Knesset Israel. 
Okay, so Donna then says, um, does he mean for this praying at the same time business, <laughs> she said with great precision, um, <laughs> to, serve, um, to serve the remote individual? Uh, oh, that's great. And what a great question. Um, or is it just, as you say, you know, that people are lighting candles. So you, so you, uh, uh, so, so you, you, so you too, whether you may or may not know how to do it. So in other words, you're saying. No, no, no. I actually, you know, that people are lighting candles simultaneously to you whom you may or may not know. This right. is what you said, you rabbi. And right. then I took Natan's post that you just read as a response, whether he intended, I don't know, as a response to mine. And then I actually said after that, um, so based on what Natan says, materially, which is my question, ma so materially, this, this praying at the same time business benefits the remote person because the community example that you gave was based on an assumption that devoid of any communication with the outside world, a single Jewish community would not know that other Jews in the world were praying. Right. So I, I'm not, I'm still not hundred percent sure I understand what you're saying, but I think I do. And so I, the, the, the way I'm thinking about it is the community uh, just to get, again to go back to uh, to use Roberta up in Boulder as our example, while the Denver community, 45 minutes away, is praying. If um, I'm, so I, I know this is not exactly what you said, but I'm kind of filtering it through a different idea. The the community in Denver can't doesn't benefit from Roberta praying at the same time, right? They they don't get the the minion mojo from Roberta, but Roberta benefits because she's connecting to that minion at the same time. That's, that's beautiful. And I think that that actually feeds in very nicely to, uh, to the next thing that I wanted to talk about. So, um, okay, so, so we talked about the hala, we talked, we, we've, we've been looking through the halachic lens. What does the halacha say about the constitution of a prayer quorum? Um, and, and, and that's- Wait, a, Rabbi, excuse me, yeah. it's Jenny. Um, Sarah Sturtz has had her hand up for a while. If you oh, can Sarah call Sturtz. on her, please, thank you. Sarah Sturtz, and then we'll, then we'll dive, we'll shift gears. You gotta unmute. Yep, I know, but you know, I move slowly. <laughs> um, you gotta lean in, it's a little hard to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, the reading that we had that referred to um, even if you don't have a minion, but there is a community, kind of set the necessity at a particular moment of the minion aside, <clears throat> if it meant having a community that could pray together and that could connect. Am I right? <clears throat> and the reason I ask about this is in this crisis situation we're in, we have all heard of Jewish communities that have gathered flying in the face of public health concerns about them gathering. And they've done it to be at the Minion. And I read something a rabbi wrote that I think relates to what I just read here in your notes. And that was, be sure you're worshiping God and not the Minion. Oh, that's great. That's a great line. And I'd like you to Coming. That's a great line. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, it's funny because we, because we have not really delved that deeply into the halacha, we have not talked about this concept of that, that rabbis in, who have been writing about this over the last month um, have been addressing. And I, I, I mentioned in my communication with, with the, to the congregation, which is this idea which is set forth in the halacha, that there are certain, um, there's a cer certain, um, leniencies that are introduced at, a, at an hour of crisis or an hour of emergency. And, um, and many, many rabbis have said that, yes, we do have to set aside some of the normal restrictions. Uh, one of the chief rabbis of Israel, the Sephardic chief rabbi, had said that, had, had, had talk, invoked this with his discussion about Passover. There are individual rabbis in the Orthodox world who, not very many, who have who have invoked this with regard to constituting a minion for Kaddish, et cetera. Um, and the conservative movement 
um, ha has been exploring this question in real time. And it's created a, several options for rabbis within the conservative movement. We have taken the path, I have taken the path that um, though we can't constitute dominion for the purpose of Baruch Hu and for the reading of the Torah, et cetera, we are, uh, we are allowing the recitation of Kaddish at, under these conditions. So even though everyone's calling in and there are not 10 people in any one enclosed space, um, we are permitting the rec recitation of the Kaddish. But um, I, I, like, I like what you, I like this line that you quoted this in this idea that we're, we're not worshiping God, we're worshiping the minion. Um, I, I'm generally sympathetic to that, but I do think, I do think that we should not discount people who are being very McDuck-Dick, people who are being very kind of stringent or careful in the details of the law. Um, and I, I do think in some cases there are people who, um, I, I think Jews have a tendency, whether, it doesn't matter what movement you're from, individual Jews in their own lives have a tendency of allowing sometimes the, the, the uh, clinging to the law to sort of obscure their vision of the holy. Every, and especially with Passover coming around the corner, every one of us has been guilty of this at some point. If you take P Pesach seriously, at some point we've all been miserably cleaning our pantries and our homes and kind of cursing the sweat and the schmitz and the dirt, and we've been miserable. And then you're, you know, you have in the back of your mind, like, yes, this is the festival in which Hashem liberated our ancestors and it was the great message of freedom to us. Like somewhere there is a disconnect. And I do think there's a risk in halachic practice of that. But that does not mean that we should kind of casually brush aside halacha when it stands in the way of what we perceive as being a pressing need. And so I sort of um, I'm open to all, a whole range of Jewish answers on these things, even those which say we can recite Kaddish during this time. But as you know, as a community, we are doing that. So I'm going to ask you to hold off your questions, and we are going to uh, shift gears now. So to, to uh, tap in, to go a little deeper on something we did talk about, um, and we've already talked about tonight, and we talked about last time, which is the idea that beyond the kind of halakhic boundaries of Minyan, there's another way for us to think about remote community and we've been doing that for thousands of years and this is what I just talked about a few minutes ago is kind of like a an associative um, like I, I feel a sense of connection with this people who are scattered across the globe and who are not in my physical space but even though, though they're not in my physical space I still feel a connection with them so now let's look at a, a place that you might not have thought we would look we're looking at the fourth chapter of Esther, a, a Megillah, the Megillah a book that we read not too long ago for, it seems like in a different universe when we were celebrating together on uh, Purim. Um, so I have a question. Mr. Uh, Alabaster, will you read, the, can you read a little, just like know, a pasuk or two in the Hebrew here for us? You gotta unmute, there you go. I don't see it. Really? Where's, where's the text? Interesting. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure how to help those who can't see it. You need to share the text, Rabbi. You yeah. can switch back to speaker. Oh, right. I'm yes. sorry. I got all excited. Can you see it now? I got it. Yeah, um, baby. Will you just read uh, right there, verse, the, I don't know, two, three verses? Sure. When Mordechai was told what Esther had said. Let's hear your Hebrew, baby. <clears throat> okay. By Agidu le Mordechai as Divre Esther. And um, Mordechai was told what Esther was said, what Esther had said. Vayomer Mordechai lehashi vel Esther, and um, Mordechai said to give to uh, Mordechai had this measured message delivered to Esther to say, "All Esther, I don't see it anymore." You don't have to change. You just, just really no, it's gone. You you care. unshared your screen. Oh, weird. I wonder what happened. Okay. You see it again? Yeah. Just read uh, not, Okay, fine. Uh Lahashivel Esther Al Tedami Benafsheikh Lehimale Besamelech Mikola Yehudi. Okay, let's pause there. So when Mordechai was told what Esther had said, Mordechai had this message delivered to Esther. Esther. So, um, because what's happening in the story at this point is that Esther is sort of begging off being involved in what's happening to the Jews. So the Jews, there's this decree against them. And Esther sort of says like, look, if I go to the king, 
um, if I go to Hashverosh, you know, we're not supposed to visit him unless he asks us to, and I could be endangering myself. And Mordechai is having none of that. And he says, do not imagine that you of all the Jews will escape with your life by being in the king's palace. On the contrary, if you keep silent in this crisis, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another quarter, while you and your father's house will perish. And who knows, perhaps you have attained to royal position for just such a crisis. So um, I, pointed, I, I point this text out for, for uh, a particular reason, and I, I probably should have kept going with it. But um, what's at play in this part is that Esther is locked up in the palace and is living a lovely, happy life. And what's being drawn out in the story is her, the extent of her moral obligation to the rest of, of the people. Now, she goes from just before this passage not feeling a sense of connection to the people through with Mordechai's kind of utzing her to having a sense of connection and obligation. And anybody know, what does she do after this passage? Anybody know what, what is she? She fasts. She fasts right? And she wants the Jews to fast. So she's literally divided, right? She's behind the palace walls, and she wants the Jews to fast. And though she's completely separated and isolated, and it's sort of, you know, there's a, a little bit of an ironic uh, uh, development, and it's just in the sense that she, you would think that she is the person who is like, you know, she's the queen, she's, life is great for her, but she considers herself to be in great peril, and she's totally isolated from her people. But she emerges from this isolation, morally speaking. She's still behind the walls of the palace, but she associates herself with the people. Mordechai kind of opens a, a door in her neshama, opens a door in her soul to see that she is bound to this people. And she advocates kind of collective action across the walls of the palace. You tell them to fast, and we're going to make this happen. Um, and I, I think that there is something very in that story that, that crystallizes this idea that we already know what it's like to, um, to bring our hearts, to allow our hearts to burst through the walls that divide us. This is not a thing that's new to Jewish people, and there's a vocabulary for this again, uh, again in our tradition. So, um, so I wanted to point to that moment in the Megillah, because, not only because we just read it not too long ago, but also because I think it, it, it is a very important in the story, moment in the story of Esther, and it is an important moment that exemplifies this idea that you can establish community um, across walls. And another reason it's such a great text is this is not just an incidental story about feeling connected with people who are, are at a distance. The, the Purim story is a story of redemption, of the salvation of the Jewish people. And so, so much rests on her, this move that she makes to feel the connection with the Jews, one, and this, this, is, this demand she makes that they take action, even though she can't see them or she doesn't even know who they are, to assist her that collectively, though they're divided, they are going to kind of manifest the salvation of the Jewish people. Okay, so um, I wanted to draw that out. Um, I'm going to leave this here in the interest of time. I was going to look at another halachic text, but we're going to uh, we're going to go past this. So, um, so it is striking with the fast of uh, with, with with the fast of of Esther, which is still an, a, a fast that's obligatory upon us. Right, the day before Purim, we fast, and that fast, and you can look at other fasts as well in the same light. When I, the fast is obligatory upon me as an individual, right? If I don't show up at shul that day, um, or if I'm on a, you know, I'm, let's say I'm going hiking somewhere on the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, and I'm nowhere near my community, that fast is obligatory upon me, but it's a fast that binds me with the community upon whom that fast is also obligatory. Right, and we could say the same of any number of mitzvah. The obligations of Shabbat are binding upon me, even when I'm not in shul, um, of course. And that somehow I'm bound with this invisible, this community that is invisible to me. And so um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, to point to that. Okay, so just to zoom out for a minute, 
we we looked at the halakha, or we, we kind of glanced at the halakha and thought about some of the themes, the way the rabbis articulate um, through the halakha, the, the notion of what it means to be bound to a community and what is the nature of community. We then talked about this thing that I'm sort of calling the uh, an associative, associative way of, of sensing community. That is something that's not halakhic, but in our hearts, we have a sense that we're connected to a people through time and space that we consider, we identify with, and we consider them to be part of our community. And the, the text that I somewhat arbitrarily used to demonstrate that was the text of the Fast of Esther from the, from the Megillah. But now I actually want to talk, I want to delve, I want to sort of shift gears and go from the, the question of what, how, how did you think about community to now thinking about what is at stake in community, right? If we delve down into, uh, if we look at rather than how do we define a community or whether a community can take place across boundaries of space and time, if instead of that, if we look at the question of why did you, why do people need community, uh, maybe we learn something else out about our current moment. And so I want to look at some of these texts and then we're going to pause again for, for discussion. Okay, so in the story of creation, as we know, um, God makes Adam and then in the second chapter makes the human beings. And then in the second chapter of Genesis, we get this very profound moment, um, which is, uh, who, who, wants to, who wants to read this? Patty, will you read us, uh, read us some English? You got to unmute. All right, we still can't hear you. Yeah, you're not plugged in. Okay, um, I, I, you know, I'll just read this, okay? So, Vayomer Hashem Elohim, lo tov hayot adam levado, ve'esei lo ezer kenegdo, ve'yitzer Hashem Elohim min ha'adama, kol chayat asedev et kol ov ha'shemayim, ve'yavei el adam yirod ma yikralo. Okay, so the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make an ezer kenegdo. Um, and I deliberately didn't translate that because it's so hard to translate and it's so interesting. Um, and we'll come back to that. Um, the Lord, but it means it's often translated as a, a helpmate, which is not a good translation, but just so you know what I'm talking about, that's, that's how it's often translated. And the Lord God formed out of the earth all the wild beasts, all the birds of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Well, whatever the man called each living creature, that would be its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky, um, but no fitting helper was found, okay? So the Lord God, that is Hashem God, cast a deep sleep upon the man, and while he slept, he, that is God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at the spot. Presumably, this is not the first time you've heard this story. And Hashem fashioned the rib that God had taken from the man into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bones. Vayomer ha'adam zot ha'pa'am etzem me'atzamai m'vasar m'vasari. L'zot yikarei isha. This one at last is the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. Or really it's isha. For from man, from Adam, was she taken. Hence a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife so that they become one flesh. We could spend the rest of our lives just reading these verses and talking about them, okay? And whenever one does a brief take on any passage of the Torah, but certainly from the creation story, you do violence to the text because there's just kind of no way to properly honor them or expose everything that's in them unless you spend a lot of time in them. But I'm reading this with a particular purpose, and that is that there, there is in the Torah this, this sense that... Um, in solitude, in the human experience of solitude, that creation is, is broken, that creation is imperfect. And it's, it is quite startling when we look through the creation story and we see that in every, every day is punctuated by, the, by this phrase, and it was good, right? God creates each day, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And so there's sort of this... 
uh, the, the Torah is telling us that the, the creation was, was made in a kind of perfect, beautiful way. And so when the Torah says, V'yomer Hashem Elokim, lo tov, you see that right there, those words? Lo tov, hiyot adam levado. Our focus may be on, it is not good for man to be alone, right? We, may, we focus immediately on, oh, solitude is not good. Being alone is not good. Loneliness is not good. And we, but, and we should get there. But what first we should notice the phrase lo tov, right? It cuts against the whole story of creation because the entire creation story is built around this idea that creation was tov. And so suddenly, what is lo tov? Creation itself somehow seems to be imperfect. And what cries out against the perfection of creation is human loneliness. And it is that that Hashem seeks to address in creating the, uh, the other person. Now in Ezer Kenegdo, I'm just going to spend a brief minute on this. So the, it's translated as a helpmate. And there's, there's a good reason for that. The word Ezer um, means a helper. Kenegdo means... Um, Either you can either translate it as in opposition to him or uh, like across from him or the way the Sephorno understands it is equal to him. Um, and there is there are grounds in the word connected to translate it as equal to him. And of course, in our patriarchal tradition, it's often been read against that valence and um, it's been seen, the emphasis has been on an ezer right? She, she is to help him as opposed to the Kenegdo, which again, this forno reads as being his fitting equal. Um, but in any event, it's clear that, that she is being made in relationship to him, that somehow they are going to build out of, uh, out of their two lives something that is relational. And that, that, is, that is essential. So God is God looks at perfection. Excuse me. God looks at creation and sees that it can't be perfect as long as there's a sense of human solitude. And in the creation of the other person and the creation of the isha, there's something that awakens in in the in the Adam, in which he recognizes two things simultaneously. One, he recognizes this is a distinct being from me, right? Which seems obvious, right? This is some, this is another being, but then he also recognizes she's like me. She's made from what I'm made out of. And I think that um, what I want to do here is draw out what is at stake in these questions about community. Thus far, we've been talking about community as a sort of, uh, in a kind of functional way. How can we feel community? How can we feel community? Somebody, if somebody would hit mute, if somebody who's walking along a freeway or something like that, I hear a car in your background, if you could mute yourself, it'd be great. Um, we've been talking about community in a kind of functional way, right? How do we establish it? What are the boundaries of it? What purpose does it serve? But here I wanna, I'm sort of drilling down on what is at stake in community for us? Why do we need it? Because if we ask that question, we might get to another, uh, we might be able to, to look at our current predicament in a, different, in a different way. So hence a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife so that they become one flesh. So this idea of basar achad, of becoming a single flesh, um, and obviously it's a reference to, a, to sexual union, but I think we are clearly supposed to see in the, in the human relationship a repairing of this of this initial breach, addressing the the brokenness of creation that existed in human solitude, but also in the sense that um, she was he, she was made from him, and now they come together again. Okay, so I want to lay that out there, and I then want to now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a text from Soloveitchik on this, and then we're going to pause for questions and comments. For Joseph Soloveitchik, for those who do not know, Soloveitchik was called the Rav, which just means the rabbi. And um, if you find yourself in a position where people are just calling you the rabbi or whatever your profession is, you know, the tailor or the computer expert, you know you've like really hit the top of your, of your world, <laughs> of your game. Soloveitchik is, um, 
is not the father of modern orthodoxy. He's often um, misnamed, he's, he's called that, but it's, it's an error. He did not invent uh, modern orthodoxy, uh, but he really was the great voice of modern orthodoxy in the 20th century and gave, it, gave orthodoxy a way to articulate uh, its beliefs and to engage with um, some of the core problems of modernity from within a orthodox halachic context. So um, just to set up this piece, so Soloveitchik has a gorgeous, uh, has done incredible gorgeous writing um, about the creation story and about, um, about the kind of the uh, existential loneliness that human beings experience. And he knew what he was talking about. Some of this writing comes from the period of his life after his wife died. And he's writing not theoretically and philosophically, but he's writing from kind of core experience of his own life and what it means to be an isolated person who's lacking their partner. So um, if somebody would just jump in, um, uh, Donna Erbs, will you read the English of this Soloveitchik, um, which is from an essay that he wrote called Confrontation in the, in the journal called Tradition in the 60s. God created Eve, another human being. Two individuals, lonely and helpless in their solitude, meet, and the first community is formed. The community can only be born, however, through an act of communication. After gazing at each other in silence and defiance, the two individuals involved in a unique encounter begin to communicate with each other. One, out of the midst of muteness, the miraculous world rises and shines forth. Adam suddenly begins to talk. Vayomer Ha'adam. Vayomer Ha'adam, he addresses himself to Eve, and with his opening remark, two fenced-in and isolated human existences open up, and they both ecstatically break through to each other. Okay, so what he's trying to articulate here is, is, is the birth of human community. Um, so he's, he's not just talking about like, oh, look at these two lovely people who had a relationship. He's trying to articulate the existential experience of loneliness and the ways in which this story in Genesis addresses this profound need that we have in, in, uh, to, to, to reach out and to connect and the ways in which human community and, and, and the face of another person can complete our humanity. And so when he says, um, Adam suddenly begins to talk. He's not speaking theoretically. He's looking very carefully at the text here. At verse 23, then the man said, this one is at last is bone of my bones. This is, this is when Adam begins to speak and to really then therefore fully in Soloveitchik's view, fully become a human being by, our, by, uh, by acquiring language. Um, he's now fully human in some sense. And what, what catalyzes that moment is the existence of, of a human community. The fact that Eve now exists allows him to be fully human and, of course, allows her to be fully human. And now you have the first, the first human community. So this, um, what I want to ask you in this text, excuse me, what I want to ask you in light of this text um, and if, uh, you know, we're going now from the very, very heavy philosophical to the very concrete and personal, the world of personal experience. But what I want to ask you is, do we and can we get this um, in a virtual world? Do we have our, our sort of essential loneliness, what, what Soloveitchik argues is our essential human loneliness, can that be addressed through virtual community? And that's and part of my question to you is a little bit philosophical and you're welcome to answer it philosophically, but I'm also interested in your experience as a human who has existed over the last couple of weeks in virtual community, um, what it's been like for you. And I've actually been surprised even over the last week, my answers about the meaning of human community in, in the virtual world have changed just based on personal experiences I've had. But I wanna open it up a little bit and just ask you to reflect on your experience in light of these texts. And, and again, the basic question is, does our experience in, virtual wor in the virtual world address our need to, to confront the other and to engage and to reach out beyond our loneliness? Or is there something essential missing 
in this in this world. You can raise your hand and I'll I'll call on you. Roberta, you got to unmute. I know. I think that what's missing is the touch. The touch in no way. There's nothing that makes the touch, not touching, feel like touching. Right. But I think that the emotions can be brought to the surface. When I see my grandkids on uh, FaceTime or, or Zoom, the love flows out of me. When I see you, Rabbi Josh, just having not seen you in so long, the closeness and the, um, the relationship that we had and the classes I took with you, that's there. Right, if you were there. here, I don't think it would be more if you were sitting here. I feel that. Right. So I think that uh, there, it's hard to reach out. I am newly alone in, in my home. And that makes it much harder for me to reach out. And it makes the loneliness intense. Mm. And that is reaching out from a deep place. Right. But if I don't do it, then I'm missing out. Right. Thank you for your your uh, your candor and and uh, your the depth of what you're saying. For it's not surprising you knowing you as I do that you would just make get this conversation to a place of realness very quickly because that's who you are. But so I hear you saying two things. One is that um, there is a real connection that surfaces when we engage other people in this, in this context, like actual memories and actual feelings of love and connection, but that there, we can't escape the, the lack of that touch. Yeah, okay, other, other thoughts, Daniel? I would uh, respectfully uh, disagree with our friend Roberta and uh, put before you that, uh, that community is a lot like, um, say, being in love. That is, the, the member of the community or the lover defines for themselves whether or not they're, they're in love. I see people, uh, thank goodness I'm not one of them, but I see people who form some sort of loving relationship with someone they've only met online and yet they want to be together and and uh and in the same way i see uh occasionally fraudulent relationships like that where somebody will connect with somebody online and a thinks b is something that they are not because of the way b has presented him or, him or herself right that's interesting they think they're in community they think they're in love but to the one who thinks he's in love, he is in love. And to the one who, um, who doesn't have that connection, they don't have that connection. Right, right, yeah. Well, so, you know, I, just, I, have, to, I have to interject because I haven't spoken enough yet. It's finally my turn, okay, people? Um, I just wanted to share this one, this one. So there's an interesting halakhic discussion that what Daniel, what, you're, what you just said, called this up for me. I'll try to make this brief. There's an interesting halakhic discussion about whether mic, whether uh, how how a microphone can be employed in a religious co Jewish context. One part of the discussion is whether you can use a microphone on Shabbat, but there's another part of the discussion that with, which is really this is a non-issue outside of the Orthodox world now. But whether if you hear a blessing through a microphone, forget forget about the Shabbat part. If you hear a blessing through a microphone. And that without that microphone, you would not have been able to hear it, or you cannot hear it except for the microphone. Can you answer amen? Okay, which may seem ridiculous and theoretical, but at the core of the halakhic question is precisely what we're talking about. How important is the actual physical presence to establishing a connection with another person? Because of course, when a person makes a bracha, what makes a blessing, we're obligated to say amen. And in doing that, we're affirming like I'm part of what you are. Right? I'm here as you're saying that blessing for the water you're drinking or the food you're eating. And there is this incredible uh, discussion and I couldn't follow, the, I didn't have the time to follow the whole thread, but there's this incredible discussion. Most, most of the scholars say, look, there's a difference between 
um, between a microphone and a human voice. We all know that there's a difference. And if you're not encountering a human voice, then it, it, it's not the same. But there are some scholars, in fact, Rev Moshe Feinstein, who's a, a halachic giant of the 20th century, says, well, hold on, why do we think that they're the same? And I know, Daniel, it sounds like I'm, I'm on a tangent, but I'm trying to come back to, I think there's a core uh, of what you're saying that I think is so haunting and, and powerful. Rev Moshe Feinstein says, I don't know why we're assuming that there is a difference between a microphone and a, uh, and a human voice. And he, I'm, these are not his words, but he says, essentially what he says is, a voice goes through a process, um, a physical process between, excuse me, a, a, a microphone takes a human voice and it puts it through a particular kind of mechanical process before it can be heard by the other person. But he says, if you take away the microphone, the same thing is happening, right? Sound is traveling through the air and you have uh, the ear canal and the sound has to go through there and into the brain, right? We can break up the physical process and you find out in both cases, in order for the, in, what the interior of a human being, right? The, the, what's the, in the inner soul of the person to be expressed to the other person, there is inevitably a, uh, a cavernous divide. And so he's, so Rob Feinstein says, there is no qualitative uh, difference between hearing and uh, encountering another through a microphone or hearing them in the flesh. And so m my point is simply, Daniel, whether it's online or whether it's in, in the face of another person, people can be obscure to others. We can deceive and, and we can, even when we're not trying to deceive, we can feel a deep sense of disconnection from another because we are ultimately in some sense separated and the goal is to not be alone. Okay, other, other reflections about, about your experience in the online world and how it... How it um... I don't... Uh, Rabbi Donna Herbs has had her hand raised for a while. Donna Herbs and then Natan. Or Natan is scratching his head or raising his hand, we don't know, but Donna. Thank you. So um, just to point out what you just said, it's electricity either way. It's using electricity to convert a message to impulse to message. Either way. Okay, but back to the, um, I, I'm thinking about what Daniel said about um, an exclusive online meeting or presence. Um, what what we found, and I brought this up last time, in our Hevra, when we started doing our first uh, virtual Tahara, was that we couldn't imagine having done it without having done in-person Tahara before. And I think it's not only because of knowing physically what you would be doing and then trying to imagine that virtually, which is in essence what we do. I think it also has to do with, this is how you feel in community as a Tahara team when you perform this mitzvah for a met or a met, uh, meta. So it, it speaks to what Daniel says, that yes, if you've never met a person, it's, it's a different, it can be catastrophically different, but it's a different, a qualitatively different experience to, that, to be online with them exclusively. Right. So you're, you're saying, if I understand you correctly, you're saying there's something in order, you, I think you're saying you can have a real experience or some kind of community virtually, but it has to be grounded in some initial actual physical reference point? I think that for me, it's deeper. Yeah. Even at work, when I see somebody on a, you know, on a, on a Zoom meeting or whatever, if I have known them in person, there's like a little different right. zets between us. Right. <laughs> you know, right. A little different energy between us. Nicely said. Nicely said. Thank you. Beautiful. Natan. Um, I was actually going to say almost exactly what Donna just said which is that now that I'm teaching an online, I'm not online, I'm teaching a remote class. And some of the students I know from before, 
And so when they say something in the class, when they speak on the video, I have a sense of who they are and their physicality. Right. And the other students, I've never met them before. So I see an image of them and I hear their voice, but it's not the same kind of connection. I'm not grasping. You know what I mean? It's, it, it, you're not getting a real sense of, oh, this is who this person is. This is why I don't generally like teaching online at all, because for me, the teacher student relationship is um it has a physicality to it actually you know right. i i knew i kind of knew that before but i never realized it on such an intense level yeah that's so interesting right yeah just just being in the being in the presence of another person and, and just seeing how seeing how their body moves or what their voice sounds like their facial looks these subtle things maybe that you can't see in the world online and the, uh, i don't often talk about people's energy or their aura but there is something to that you know right <laughs> Oh my goodness, Natan Mahir. You've been in Portland too long, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, anybody else? Uh, Patty and then Phil. We still can't hear you, Patty. We love you and would love to hear what you have to say, but time out. Okay, we're going to go to Phil. We'll come back to Patty. So, Phil. Rabbi, uh, your, uh, your uh, comment here mentioned about Adam and Eve as the first community, but we're really not talking about the first community. We're talking about Jewish law and halacha, which is a little bit different and came later in, you know, and I think that we should worry about, not worry, but Adam and Eve is one thing, but what do we do as Jews? Right. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's my thought. That's all I want right. to say. Right. You want, you're, you're like, let's talk talkless. Like how does, how does this affect, us in this moment and what do we do and I, I i think absolutely that's that's that is the question we need to have in mind during this whole conversation patty third time's a charm this by the way this is just so perfect i mean what an excellent this is this just fits into the conversation i did not pay patty for okay she's going to type okay she's going to type something okay um so I wanted to say, oh, sorry, uh, Eli, you want to say something? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think uh, for, for extroverts, this is a, just in general, I think probably a harder experience. And so, you know, on a personal level, uh, it's, this is the first week that I'm kind of doing this virtual stuff. And, um, but I was, you know, definitely missing everything that I do is with the community. Right. From, from the morning until, you know, the potential Tahara that I may do. It's so it's hard, but at the same time, it, I remember, um, uh, Halacha in Yeshiva when, uh, you know, for instance, if you're on the phone with someone and they make a bracha, uh, you know, are you, are you Yotze in the bracha? Um, some people would say no. Other people would say yes, but you're still allowed to say a main. Right. You can say, if someone says, if you hear someone say Barhu, if you call someone and like you hear Barhu in the background, you're allowed to say Barhu. It may not be an actual halacha, but you're allowed to say Barhu. You're not, right. you're not, you're not supposed to not say Barhu. So in that sense, I think that um, there's something to gain from the level of technology that we have and the ease that we can connect with each other. And while I, I'm acknowledging that it, it is different, especially, right. you know, I understand Roberta because I, I live alone and um, my cat's not really that cool. So I don't... <laughs> She's sweet, but I don't have, you know, anyone to touch or any, anyone to share intimate moments with friendship wise. And that, that's, that's difficult. And at the same time, like it, it takes work to wake up in the morning and go to shul and be a part of a minion at seven thirty in the morning. And it takes work to log into zoom. And so it's just a level of work and, you know, your dedication, but, uh, I would personally think that once we have holograms and we can hologram ourselves in 
to a place, then I personally would feel more comfortable davening with right. a minion. I I, pers- I don't feel comfortable. It's not my thing to daven online. Right. right. Um, I, I get it. There's something missing. There's something it's, missing it's from that. Complete right. like that. I you can't. I just cannot replace that experience with davening right. in my house. Yeah, well, listen. We're, we're or adopting we are, online with people. Yeah, well, listen, we're, we are in, we're really in new territory. And um, these are not just like theoreticals, right? This, this um, for some of us on this call and some of us in our community, the world that it exists now, it's like, yeah, okay, right. I'm adjusting. It's not quite great, but it's fine. And for other people, and this is deeply, deeply trying. And it's, and it's no joke. I mean, for some people, this is an incredibly... Um, incredibly trying experience. Um, and uh, so, you know, none of this is to be taken lightly. It's very real. Let me just get Patty's point and then I, Sarah, and then I'm going to shift gears and take us to the kind of final stretch. Patty says, I think the problem comes when trying to feel a whole community, but I can't see everyone at once. It's easier when it is one to one, right? When you, when you, when you say feel like when you, when you encounter another, there's a feeling. I think I take it, you don't mean physical touch necessarily but you have a sense in your heart of a connection, right? And here it's like when you were in this world, maybe it's kind of more conceptual. It's in the mind, right? And, and we're, we're yearning for some kind of feeling. Okay, Sarah Sturtz. Okay. Last comment for this. Can't hear you. You're muted. Still can't, there you go. I am muted. Um... I just commented to Robert yesterday that I was grateful that it was two of us um, here in this situation and not one. So Roberta, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, If I were alone, I would find this, it's hard enough. And Eli, I don't wanna make you feel funny for whether you don't get up, can't get up, don't feel davening virtually online is the same, which I understand because you're a people person. But I look to see you at the Minion, and I miss you when you're not there. Yeah. That's got to count for something. Gosh, you beautiful, beautiful. You know, All right, you sold me. You sold me. <laughs> but you Rabbi, sold me. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning at 8, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. So listen. Um, Nothing like just a little tiny bit of guilt. I'll be there. I'll be there in my office. Very effective. Guilt, guilt, community. guilt can cross boundaries and walls, by the way. So, um, hang on. Okay, real quick, real quick. The virtual community works fine for me. The shortcoming is mine. Is I yours, find, you said? I, I find it very hard to focus. I am being bombarded with information. Yep. I'm listening and reading and checking too much. Yep. My head is spinning, and I yep. think we're all just going to be that much more sugar when this is all over. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, and I think that um, it's true. And and as a separate, um, anyway, I I want to offer some resources for people not tonight, but I want to offer some resources for people for addressing exactly that. We we are. Even if you're doing great with on the community level and you don't feel lonely, there's the kitty cat. Um, even if you don't feel lonely, there is just neurologically or physiologically, I don't know what the word is, something that's extraordinarily difficult about staring at a screen all day. And um, I, I want to offer some resources from within the Jewish tradition um, uh, for dealing with anxiety and unplugging. I actually think it's really important that we that we unplug for, for chunks of the day, get outside when you can. Um, but anyway, um, so listen, we're gonna go a little bit late. I was hoping to land the plane by 8.30, but we're gonna go until 8.40. Um, okay, so we've talked about a couple of different things. We've talked about um, a halakhic approach to thinking about community. Then we talked about this thing for which I don't quite have a name, but the associative or the religious approach, which is to think about the ways in which um, we have, we. We have connections across time and space. We talked about the Book of Esther and the fact that Esther prays on behalf of this community um, that she's not physically in the presence of. And we've, we've talked a lot about different ways that we can have uh, an affiliation or association with Jews who are not near us, around us, and for other human beings across time and space. Um, but I actually want to say that what I think is missing from this conversation 
um, thus far is the fact that, that Jewish community has not only a human element and not only a theological element, right? All the, the halakhic material, of course, is all about how do we address God as people, um, but it has a moral element. And it's, it's that that I want to I wanna turn to now as we think about whether a community can exist um, in virtual space. So can you see my screen here? Can you see the texts? So some of you who are part of my Torah study group are already familiar with what I'm about to share, but, um, uh, but that's okay. Okay, so the, the text number seven, it comes from the, the passage of the golden calf. So Moshe is up on Har Sinai, he's up on Mount Sinai. And um, when he's up there, the people gather against Moses and they demand the creation of this uh, golden calf. Um, and uh, Natan, will you read this in Hebrew? Sure. Vayar ha'am ki voshesh Moshe laredet min ha'ar, vayikahel ha'am al aharon, vayomru elav, kum, aselanu elokim asher yelchu lefanenu, ki ze Moshe ha'ish asher ha'elanu me'eretz mitzrayim, lo yadanu mehayalo. Great. Um, so, which means when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, the people gathered against Aaron and they said to him, come make us a God who shall go before us for that man Moshe, who brought us up from the land of Egypt. We don't know what's happened to him. Um, there's a whole interesting conversation about, uh, which is not relevant, but I can't resist it because it's so fascinating. When it says, make us an Elo Elohim here, whether they actually think they're making a God, but, but of course the word Elohim can also mean a ruler or a leader or a judge. So whether they think they're replacing God or whether they think they're replacing Moses, like somehow a figure to rally around, totally irrelevant to our discussion, but just fascinating. What I wanted to point out here is this verb, vayikahel, vayikahel. Okay, so the root of this word is uh, kihila, excuse me, you also know this word from, from the word kihila, which means community, right? Um, every, every rabbi in, ever has t given some sermon or written a, a article in which they've talked about kihila, kadosha, holy community. Um, so this, this is the, the verb uh, to, to, um, to gather. To, to form a community or to gather. And here, well, actually, but I'm gonna leave it there for a moment. So the people gather um, al Aharon against Aaron or around Aaron, it's not exactly clear, but I really wanna emphasize this verb, vayikahel, um, which is this English word gathered, okay? So the golden calf, there was a gathering of the community demanding the creation of something to fill the void, right? Something to, to uh, answer their, their needs. Then we fast forward many, many chapters, three chapters, um, to a totally separate episode after we've kind of, the golden calf story is behind us. And now we're in the penultimate uh, parsha of the book of Exodus. And in this, uh, what happens is that the, the people are, are just about ready to start building the Mishkan, uh, whose instructions they've been receiving for the last many chapters. And so how does the Torah portion begin? Vayakel Moshe et kol hadat b'nei Yisrael. Will somebody read this in English? Who has not had a chance to read yet? Who would like to? Cliff, will you read this in English? You can unmute yourself. You're still muted. Okay, how about now? Okay, Riva, you go for it. Yeah, Riva volunteered. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go Riva. Oh, okay. Moses then convoked the whole Israelite community and said to them, these are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do. On six days, work may be done, but on the seventh day, you shall have a Sabbath of complete rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your settlements on the Sabbath day. Moses said further to the whole community of Israelites, this is what the Lord has commanded Take from among you gifts to the Lord. Everyone whose heart so moves him shall bring them gifts for the Lord, gold, silver, and copper. Okay, thank you. So the main point that I want to draw out here, and I, I'm going to just mention it briefly and then 
go in a different direction and circle back to it is this word via Kel. So the same verb, do you see, do you see those three letters right there? Um, kuf, hey, lamed and kuf, hey, lamed. It's a different conjugation, which we'll talk about in a moment, but it's the same verb. Um, and which I'm going to argue in a moment is, is very, is very significant. Um, but before I do that, what I want to point out, um, initially I was just going to include the first verse because it contains the thing about the, the people being gathered in a kahila. But I decided to keep the, the verses two through five here because in verse two and three, what you have is a discussion of Shabbat. So Moses gathers the people and first he talks about Shabbat, which is the sanctification of time. And then, and I only gave uh, two verses here, but it goes on and on and on and on. Moses then begins, begins to give them instructions for the creation of the Mishkan, which is the sanctification of space. So the people gather, Moshe tells them how to sanctify time through Shabbos. And then Moses goes on to give the instructions about the sanctification of space. This is the holy space we're gonna, be, we're gonna build. And if we build it, Hashem will dwell among us. And there's a lot made in, in the Jewish legal literature, which is off topic here about why the discussion of Shabbat comes before the discussion of the Mishkan. But my point here is simply that we talked about, and in, both in this conversation and in the previous conversation, about the significance of the fact, and this is where I invoked Abraham Joshua Heschel, the significance of the fact that, um, that our tradition emphasizes the sanctification of time over the sanctification of space and the ways in which that is important for our own conception of what it means to be part of a religious community who, uh, for a people who has never had a, a space that lasts, right? Of course, uh, Eretz Yisrael is the, is the place of our hopes and our dreams and of our, our, of our ancestors, ancestors and the place of our yearning. We were there and the temple was destroyed, but the destruction of our space uh, did not um, did not bring about the destruction of our people because we went all over the globe and no matter where we were it was the sanctification of time that brought us together the observance of Shabbat and the Chagim and um, and so I wanted to I wanted to include that here but really that's that's just sort of a footnote my main point that I want to dwell on here is the repetition of this word via Kel which again is the same verb that you have up here. And here it was translated as convoked. They were convoked, but it's really gathered. It's really the same word in English. It's gathered here and here they translate it as convoked, but it could say gathered here. Vayakel, vayikahel. Same verb, different conjugation. And what I want to suggest is that, um, you know, we live in a, in a time in which be, I think because even before all of this craziness, because we live in such an isolated uh, fragmented society, um, we talk about community all of the time. Um, you know, you can look at advertisements, you can look at, at advertisements for gyms or for mahjong clubs or for synagogues or whatever it is. And the idea that people are seeking community is very prevalent and people want to satisfy their need for community. It's a basic human yearning as we've, as we've seen in some of these texts. But I want to argue that when we talk about community without talking about uh, the purpose for which a community gathers, um, we, we make a grave danger. There are all kinds of ways of satisfying our need for community, but Jewish community is oriented around a purpose. Jewish community is directional. It moves forward in history, so to speak, in terms of it, 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 it accomplishes a goal that is required, a goal that is needed. And so up here in the golden calf story, um, it's true, it was a gathering, it was a community. But what I take from, this is a, a reflexive, just bear with me on the grammar here, this is a reflexive, um, the community was gathered, um, the community came gathered against Aaron. To me, that, that suggests that there's a sort of arbitrariness. Their need for community could have been satisfied by any number of things. It doesn't have a purpose except to kind of satisfy their own yearning. There's no greater moral purpose. It is not a moral community, right? Community can exist in all kinds of forms. Community can exist as an expression of nationalism. Fascists are very good at creating community. Right, community is not a good in and of itself. It has to point in a direction 
and have a purpose. And here there's a sort of leaderless, um, you know, gelling of the community out of a desperate need and a, and, and a sense of anxiety. Where is our leader? What should we do? And it doesn't have any reason for being other than to alleviate people's anxiety. That is a extraordinarily dangerous and amoral form of community. Really what a community is, and I think that this is obviously, I'm introducing this to us because this is, remains a challenge even in virtual space or all the more so in virtual space, is to have a community that moves in a direction to satisfy a moral requirement that is placed before us by Hashem and by the Torah. And it's here, the difference here is the gathering is very purposeful. Moses gathers them. And the reason he's gathering them is to give them instructions about what it means to lead a life of purpose and meaning. And um, of course, within the, the religious community that God is establishing um, is a kind of ethical foundation about how we treat one another, about how we care for one another. We're not looking at any of those mitzvot here. We're not looking at the ethical mitzvot. We're just looking at the at the, the process of sanctification of time and space. But we know that, that Jewish community um, has, uh, is replete with moral requirements, whether it's tzedakah or whether how we treat another human being or whether it's uh, how we treat our spouses or how we constitute a community to care for people who don't have what they need. Um, that is community. And so the other, the final way of looking at for community that I want, the, the final test for community um, is whether it is a moral community, it has moral commitments that it, that it is actualizing. And so I think that the great test for us, if we want to see um, if the community we have in virtual space is a real community, it goes beyond whether it fulfills halachic requirements it goes beyond whether it makes us feel like we are connected to other people. Of course, both of those are extremely important. I'm not diminishing them, but those are insufficient. Ultimately, whether to, to answer the question whether the community, whether what we have in virtual space is actual community, goes beyond both of those, and even beyond the feelings of whether it addresses our own existential loneliness, which is also critical that that we address. None of those are to be ignored. The test is whether we can actually create a moral community that is continuing to, to build a, a world of holiness and whether, whether we can actualize that and bring it beyond words. So my final question for you, with all of that in mind, and I know I'm going at 100 miles an hour and then we'll open it up to conversation, is for me the really interesting part of all of this is not the question I would say the question of whether, given all of these ways of thinking, whether we can say that community exists in virtual space, but it's given all of these things that we say must be in place for community to exist virtually, if those have to be in place to exist virtually, would we say that we have been doing that in actuality? So in other words, if the plague, God willing, were to end tomorrow, um, and the community of Sharei Torah were to, were to were kind of return to normal. My question is, and clearly this is not a yes or no. My question is, is this, is this synagogue community that we call community, does it meet these standards that we've talked about um, in, 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 any of, in, any of these, in any of these ways? And if not, what do we have to do to change that? Is it a community that addresses the human yearning for companionship? Is it a community that gives us a sense that we're connected to something bigger than ourselves? And finally, is it a community that is actually creating a more moral order and responding to the call of the Torah to gather in a particular moral direction? So for me, ultimately, the, the interesting question is um, whether we can take out of this experience and our reflection and our reflection on the texts some lesson that we can bring back into our lives. And with that, I'm going to open it back up to conversation and um, your opinions. Thoughts about what I've just said. What do, what do we learn about community and where we're falling short or what we have, what, what we still have, what work we have remaining to do to create Jewish community? 
Cliff Ockley. So I've had an opportunity to talk to Eli a little bit on the side. And, um, you know, I think, and Daniel, and the thing is, is all of us here in this group are part of a community building process rather than, a, than not a community building process. And um, the visual, somebody mentioned visual before, I think that's absolutely critical for those of us that can see um, because we, 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 we see more than we can hear and smell. And um, so that component is absolutely critical to this process of community. So this new technology has given us an ability to communicate on both a visual and auditory level that we only would have been able to do in a minion in a synagogue in previous years. But now we stepped into a new space and um, it seems to, to work. I mean, you know, I've been in uh, Sunday Minions uh, online, felt pretty good to me, except that somebody couldn't really easily sit down and teach me how to lay to fill in, um, which somebody had to do in person, in place at some point in time. Uh, but I think, I think this can work. Right. I don't, I think hopefully not permanently, but on a temporary intermittent basis. And one of the other things, one of the other people said, I think that was really important. I can't remember who it was. You know, if you're handicapped or travel confined or time confined, you know, one of the big benefits in, in, is in this group right now is that it's dark out and I don't like driving at night, you know? Um, and so I can participate in this group. Right. Right now, right here, which I would right. never be able to do. Right. Because you're, I really have a hard time seeing at night. You're more connected than you were than you could be before. That's correct. Nice. Right. Okay. That might be the last word for the evening. So um, then, then in closing, I want to just say then that um, oh, last word to Eli, and then I'm going to do a khatima. Um, I just want to know how you feel, like about, like as a rabbi of a community yeah. leading like what's what's your experience been how's your adjustment as a synagogue rabbi been to uh, becoming rabbi virtual rabbi rose yeah um I, uh, I'm still sorting through it I will say that when I when I began to go into this text I brought um a a bias. I mean, it's, we live in such a weird moment because on the, you know, not, not just this, this terrible moment we're in, but I mean, just the modern era, because on the one hand, we're all so reliant on technology and we use it all the other, all the time. But on the other hand, there's this sort of like cultural narrative, like everyone knows that technology isn't good for you and that, you know, that somehow, you know, virtual space is making people more lonely. That's the sort of thing that everyone knows. So I went into it with a bias um, uh, that, um, you know, I was going to discover in the material, the sense that like, uh, we're just sort of broken apart and we're fractured and that our main task is to navigate our loneliness and separation. Um, but I, the truth is actually, I think much more complicated. Um, in some ways there's much, there can be much greater intimacy in this, in this medium, um, in, in, in ways that I, that still continue to, to surprise me. Um, and in some ways, I, just, I agree. as a little example, I think that for some people, for some reason that I, I began to talk with a, a therapist today about this, and I'm not sure of the answer um, as to why this is the case, but there's something about seeing your face along with the faces of everybody else that allows people sometimes to sort of draw themselves in a little more and do a little more tsum and to make more space for other people. I've just noticed that. Um, and, but you know, for other people, it's profoundly alienating and it doesn't work. So I just think it's, it's, it's complicated. So in some ways, there's been beautiful outpouring of community in ways that I have not felt for a long, long time. And it's brought our community together. But I'm also aware that there are people who can't be on this call because they don't have a computer or they have no idea how to operate it, or they're just too self-conscious. Um, and I'm, uh, Another thing I'm aware of, and I'll, I guess I'll, I'll draw it to a close just because, we're, because of time, you know, 
because of all the need to, there's been so many urgent matters that we've had to address um, in a good way. I mean, a lot of good stuff has come out of the synagogue staff's work over the last couple weeks, but there's been so much urgency and so many very like flashing red lights to be addressed that I haven't really done deep pastoral care for a couple of weeks. Um, you know, I haven't, uh, I have not been in touch. There's a broad section of the community where I've not been able to ch check in with people about their health or, or how they're dealing with, with this stress or that stress. Um, so I'm, I, I think it's, I think, you know, maybe that's why I decided to close on this idea of moral community. Um, I, I don't, I think it's, we're not going to know whether virtual community exists until this is all over, because I think that the final test is whether we are, whether we will find a way to respond to the needs of the people within our community, whether they're financial, emotional, spiritual, whether we have a way to make everybody feel less alone. Um, and again, what so fascinates me is I don't know that that's been a question, a sufficient question in our minds even before all of this. And so what's so powerful about this, uh, this, this exploration of text that we've done together, I think, is the ways in which it challenges us, as I said, not just to answer the immediate question, are, are we still in community, but to, to answer the question, were we ever in community? Or, or more properly, maybe a better question is, what, do we, what would we have to do and how would we have to act to live up to the challenge of our tradition to create a full-hearted community, which is something that is different from just creating or living in a synagogue. And so um, uh, I guess with that, I want to thank you all. What an incredible pleasure to learn with so many of you. Um, so oh, deep, deep, insightful comments. And I'm very, very grateful. Tomorrow night is, um, uh, tomorrow night I'm doing a, a shiur with my, my good friend, uh, Sean Vandor. And I mentioned this to some of you, um, and I'll just put this up here, one sec. So Sean and I, uh, this is Sean, great guy, interesting guy. He's an author and a deep thinker. Um, and uh, this is me, this is not what I look like anymore. Um, and uh, we're gonna be talking about, we've been studying for some time now, conflict in community. Um, even though it shares the word community, this is a totally different topic. He and I were, have been studying this for months now about what, what ancient and modern Jewish sources say about uh, what it means to, uh, to live in a kind of heterogeneous community, either a community within the Jewish world where there are different opinions or in, in the kind of national discourse that's so heavily divided and so broken, what, what insight does Jewish teaching have to think through some of the challenges of, uh, of navigating communities of difference and creating community where there is conflict. So Sean and I will be doing that tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And uh, mostly I wanna thank you and, and wish you a beautiful evening. Wash your hands, be healthy, take care of yourselves. And if you or someone you know is in need of uh, support from the community or from the rabbi, please let me know. Don't assume that I'm aware of it. God bless, and it was wonderful to see you all. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Back to